Hi, and welcome to episode 247 of the Untethered Podcast. Today we have Abby Gack joining us. Abby is a speech language pathologist, feeding specialist, international board certified lactation consultant, IBCLC, private practice owner, and mom of three young boys aged five, three, and eight months. She has specialized experience in treating children, adolescents, and adults with complex medical diagnoses heavily impacted by feeding and swallowing disorders, speech and language disorders, and orofacial myofunctional disorders. Her professional experience began in the suburbs of Chicago, where her passion for pediatric feeding and swallowing disorders began. When moving back to Iowa five years ago, she began a unique opportunity of starting a speech program within an ENT private practice. This experience provided her with more specialized experience in the airway and myofunctional therapy space. In 2021, she transitioned the speech department to her own private practice, Child Works Therapy Clinic in Sioux, uh, Sioux City, Iowa. She now has five other speech therapists that work for her and enjoys being able to serve more and more families with her growing clinic. In 2020, she also started her professional Instagram page at feedingbabes underscore SLP, where she enjoys sharing tips and tricks for little ones at mealtimes, breastfeeding and bottle feeding support, real life motherhood moments, and her passion of empowering families to feel confident in feeding their child through all phases of life. Abby has taken many hours of continuing ed in the areas of pediatric feeding and swallowing, orofacial myofunctional therapy, lactation, infant feeding, and motor speech disorders. Quick disclaimer, all information, content, and material of this podcast are the opinions of the speakers and is for the informational purpose only and not intended to serve as a substitute for the consultation, diagnosis, and or medical treatment of a qualified healthcare provider. Welcome to the Untether Podcast. I am your host, Hallie Balkin. I'm a certified myofunctional therapist, feeding specialist, podcaster, business owner, and mentor. This podcast is all about getting your questions answered and collaborating with colleagues to bring you the most up-to-date information in the orofacial myofunctional therapy, airway, tethered oral tissue, and pediatric feeding therapy space. If you're new here, I challenge you to keep an open mind and join my mission to spread this message far and wide. If you've been around since June 2019, thanks for being a loyal listener. As we jump into today's episode, remember to listen with correct oral rest posture. Tongue up, lips closed, teeth apart, breathe through your nose. Let's get started. Abby, welcome to the podcast. Hello. I'm excited for you to join us today. And, you know, I know that you, I, I call it the perfect trifecta. You have uh, credentials in pediatric feeding, in myofunctional, you know, therapy space, airway. Um, and when I say ped feeding, you have it both in like, you know, the therapy side as well as the IBCLC side. So I would love for you just to speak to, you know, how you got into that and like what threw you into this trifecta of uh, credentials, if you will. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I in grad school had kind of a cool opportunity that um one well two i should say of my professors one of the two he um spent a lot of time in um the nicu so he was a sweet old man super sweet professor that i just really loved and adored um and so he kind of gave up that perspective of being in the nicu that kind of stuff and that obviously intrigued me um and then i had um another dysphagia professor who um, trained under um, Logaman. So she like knew her dysphagia stuff and it was like the hardest course ever, but I was all about it, all about the medical side of things. And so I knew for my internships and like going out into my career, I was super hopeful that I could be in like the feeding space, infant space. And I think, you know, you've maybe heard this before, but like you know, everyone wants to be in the NICU and I'm like, I'm going to be in the NICU, all this stuff. So, um, I did get a cool opportunity in my internships to work at a children's hospital or to be an intern at a children's hospital, um, and be in their feeding clinic. And then also do one day a week of observing in their NICU. So I did get a lot of great like internship experience. Um, and then after grad school, um, my husband's job took us to the suburbs of Chicago and kind of by accident, I just started sending my resume out to <laughs> different clinics, all the things of like, I just need a job. I just graduated. Um, and a pediatric private practice that was owned by a speech pathologist, um, interviewed me and she was like, you know, we do a lot of feeding therapy here. And I was like, oh, awesome. Like, that's what I want to get into. That's what I want to do. Um, she's like, great. Well, we're going to like hit the ground running. <laughs> so I started with her and she was a really awesome mentor. Um, she kind of 
led the way of like showing me how to do things, how to work with really complex, like medical diagnoses of kids, like within my CF year, like I was working with kids that had, you know, feeding tubes, um, and trach and vent, things like that. So we had quite, I had quite the experience as a CF, like diving right in. Um, and I kind of laugh because, uh, <laughs> I kind of had to fake it till I make it. Maybe that's not a good thing to say as a therapist, but she threw me in and was super supportive, but I was like, well, we're doing it. I can't really turn back now. Um, and what was cool was being in the suburbs of Chicago is I feel like comparatively to, um, I guess maybe where I grew up, it's a very um, progressive place or there's a place where there's a lot of different specialists, but also specialists that can have um, their own niche or specialization. Um, and so I got to work with you know, a variety of professionals, whether that was ENTs, um, GI doctors, airway specialists, like myofunctional therapists, um, dentists, um, we got to work with like such an array of specialists that like helped us with seeing these really complex kids. Um, and then, you know, again, in grad school, I feel like very few of us get that experience of understanding like tethered oral tissues, airway concerns, all of that. So that is also something that she really like challenged my mind and my thinking of like, um, no, Abby, we need to understand why the child is aspirating or why the child is having difficulty feeding. We're not just, you know, putting a bandaid over it. Like, um, she was one that was like, we're referring, we're doing this. <laughs> and so okay. I feel very lucky that I kind of got the experience I wanted, like right out of grad school. Um, and so, uh, with that, obviously too, with, her seeing that I had some experience with infants, she also was like, well, let's start doing infants, like bottle feeding, breastfeeding. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Um, well, that's obviously a very like complex world too. Um, and then while I was there, I had my first son and I know you can relate to this too, but then obviously becoming a mother and then um, having a child that has their own breastfeeding difficulties really just kind of lights your fire even more for wanting to help more families and moms and babies. Um, so that really motivated me. My first son, yes, he had... Um, a tongue tie. We had difficulties with breastfeeding. Um, we kind of went through the whole gamut. And so again, having that knowledge as a mom and also a professional, I just was ready to, to kind of take off and help more parents. Um, and so then that kind of led into, I was, you know, feeling really confident, really excited with where I was at. And then my husband's job, um, moved us back or he got promoted to a position that brought us back to where him and I were both from, which is more Northwest Iowa, um, which is a very rural place comparatively to the suburbs of Chicago. So technically we do live in a city in Iowa. <laughs> I say it like that. Um, and it is a decent size for sure, but um, not, you know, the same kind of population when we were in the suburbs of Chicago. So that's what then brought us back here. Um, and I realized, wow, there's just not as many resources for families around here, but there's just as many babies and moms and children with difficulties as there was in Chicago's, but there's just way less resources. So um, that's what then kind of motivated my track here in Iowa to kind of taking the path that I did. That's amazing. It's like we all have, I feel like our own journeys and everything, but it's so rare that I hear somebody say, oh, I was exposed to X, Y, and Z, you know, related to either feeding, dysphagia, whatever, and grad school. And like right out of school, I got like my dream job where I really just got thrown into the fire and had the mentorship and support to also like allow me to do that. Like, and so that, that's just incredible because it's rare. It's really yeah, rare. Uh, very lucky. Yeah. I had a professor too, who, um, Dr. Barbara Sunnies, who was very like well-esteemed and established in the dysphagia space, but more with like adult dysphagia. And I think at the time that she, so she taught an undergraduate course and I think she was teaching, I think I took my first course with her when I was an undergrad student at Maryland, um, her dysphagia course and like, you know, the whole swallowing system, anatomy, physiology, right? So I remember that being like a really hard course. And I was like, this is a grad level course being taught to undergrads. And like she was a phenomenal surgeon, but like very much so like I think in tune with like graduate level study kind of, you know, so for undergrad, it was, it was really challenging. 
that, you know, long story short, I actually became a teaching assistant for her when I was in graduate school and became the TA for that course and created an entire like anatomy lab around her course um, when I was in graduate school, which was, I, that was cool. I loved that. Uh, I was like the beginning of my teaching career, apparently. Um <laughs> Right. But it was, you know, because I was kind of like, oh, well, I wish that I had something that was like more hands on. And, you know, we had like a lab related to the material so that there would be more of a connection between what we're learning and like what actually, you know, an application because we're not working with patients yet as undergrads. And so that was that was fun. Uh, but my experience also was all adult. Like there was no pediatric feeding anything in my grad graduate program. And of course, nothing to the oral tissues and airway was only like the lower airway stuff, you know, and trachs and vents and that kind of stuff, not upper airway that we learn in the Maya world. And so, yeah, it's, it's so interesting to see and like here, and I'd be, I would just be so curious for somebody like to like actually go out to every university and be like, what is covered in these different topics and just see, because I know, I feel like we can count on less than two hands, how many actually teach pediatric feeding, if they even teach ped feeding. I think most of it's all adult focused, if that's even part of the curriculum. Yeah. So yeah. Literally, mine was mostly adult focused. Um, I think because I just had expressed um, to both of them kind of like, oh, I'm just so interested in, you know, the pediatric world. They thankfully were just super supportive of like, providing me resources and then also helping me to hopefully get an internship that would support that passion or that interest area. Um, so I was lucky with that too. But uh, again, ours, I would say like 80%, 75% of it still was adult course. Yeah. Work. And yeah. even that, just not even the kind of stuff that what you were just saying, like that now we're <laughs> I guess, investigating more and more with that like upper airway space. Yeah. No, I, re I remember too. She had like, she ran like the radiology floor at NIH, I think at the time. And so she had like our graduate class because at the point I was in graduate school, she had us come out and actually go to radiology and sit like in the chair where they do the swallow studies. And, you know, she, we didn't actually do the swallow study and she, you know, she's like, I'm not going to expose you all to radiation and everything for no reason. But <laughs> she was, you know, she, she, I remember she used me as like the guinea pig too. She's like, Hallie, why don't you go sit in the chair? I was like, okay. So, I mean, it was really cool. I got Got some like, really cool experiences, right? But it's like we know that it's so so very different when you're dealing with like adult dysphagia patients versus the pediatric cases, and then there's even the bigger differences between diagnoses, ages, you know, whether they're breast bottle fed versus you know on solids and that whole trans. I'm like the infant year is like its own whole you know gamut of <laughs> nuances. Um, yes. Oh yes. Oh for sure. Oh for sure. Yeah. Things. Yeah. Yeah. But so you've also, you know, built out a program too with an ENT. Now, is that where you are now or is that when you were in Chicago suburbs? Yeah. So actually I'll kind of transition us. So we moved back to Iowa and um, Sioux City and in coming back, there was not any like medical jobs really available. Um, and I just felt so passionate that I wanted to stay within outpatient medical. I was not really wanting to have to go into the schools and that's obviously no disrespect to them, but I just was so passionate about what I was previously doing. Um, and so my mentor, um, the owner of the private practice in Chicago, she was like, Abby, just reach out to like, do they have an ENT in your city? Do they have like a GI in your city? Like maybe they'll just want you to work for them. And I was like, okay. So she helped me kind of draft up some emails that I sent to, um, there is an ear, nose and throat or ENT private practice here in Sioux City. Um, and I think I sent one to a GI too. Um, and thankfully the ENT private practice um, messaged me back and I'm like, you know, it's something we've always thought about. Yeah. Why don't you come in and like talk to us about it? And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, let's do it. Um, so I went in and I met with them um, kind of about like what I had been doing in Chicago and how I thought I could be a good asset to their team. And, you know, thankfully they were like, that sounds great. I feel like we we need you. You see everything that we pretty much treat. So, yeah, like, why not? Um, and so they hired me and they were kind of like, you know, build it. I guess <laughs> there was like not a lot to it, which I will say, I think I was like two and a half years into my career, maybe three. So it was a little daunting, like, uh, like build what? <laughs> I don't I don't know. Yet I, you know, I kind of, 
you know, put on the big show that I did. And I, you know, I felt really confident in my skills, but also like to build a whole program from scratch felt mm-hmm. super daunting as well. But I accepted the the challenge. Um, and it kind of started with like, let's start with you doing one day a week and see if you can kind of build that up. And then, you know, as you build more, then you can add on more days. Um, and so I did that. And um, it was funny because the first, I would say like three months, um, they were referring me just a lot of, um, you know, older adult dysphonia. Um, and I, I should preface this too. So um, there's four ENTs within this private practice and they are general ENTs. So, you know, for people maybe that don't understand, they see everything and anything really. Um, if there's certain specialization of um, certain procedures, they will refer out to like um, Omaha or Sioux Falls or like Des Moines or kind of areas if there's like more of a specialized ENT that patients need, but mostly they're general ENTs. Um, and so they see infants all the way up to like, you know, geriatrics. Um, and so I was getting all of these like 60 to 80 year old patients that had just like dysphonia, voice disorders, um, and that's just who they were kind of referring to me, which, you know, then also stepping out of my box and like, well, I've been mostly doing peds feeding and speech and stuff. And I have not done adult voice in a while, but Hey, let's dive in. Let's figure out how to do adult voice. Um, but again, I kind of consulted my mentor and she was like, Abby, they just might not know what a speech pathologist can do and see, like talk to them about like everything that you see, um, and like what you're passionate about. So I sent them, um, all four of the ENTs an email that said, Hey, just kind of want to, you know, tell you about me a little bit more and like who are patients that you can refer to me. And so I listed off, you know, infants, um, feeding issues, airway issues, um, you know, late talkers, they were having so many kids that come to their office to get hearing tests done because their pediatrician, you know, noted that they were a late talker or having speech and language difficulties and said, well, let's go get a hearing test. Um, and so they'd have a hearing test and it'd either be, you know, normal or abnormal. And they'd be like, yes. And that's kind of where it would stop. And so I'm like, send those kids to me, you know? Um, You're like, you know, the kids who have like, you know, chronic uh, ear infections and you're putting tubes in their ears, you might want to send them to me too. <laughs> yes. yes. And so I kind of was literally like everything that you, tr- you treat, I treat pretty much. Um, and it was awesome. Like the response, they were like, Oh my gosh, we had no idea, you know, that you could see all like, they were like, Abby, we have so many patients we could be sending to you. I'm like, I know. <laughs> so, You're like, I thought that's why you said yes to this. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, but you know, that kind of goes to my point too of like, sometimes I know us as professionals in this airway space or myo space can sometimes feel frustrated with providers that are like, um, you know, like not seeing the way we want them to see or, you know, like specialize in what we specialize. And I don't always think it's because they're just hard headed or don't want to be in our space. Um, I think it's that again, the aunties I work with saw a variety of things, you know, they did thyroid, they did hearing issues, they do airway, um, you know, they do cancers, head and neck cancers. And so sometimes when we're like, this patient is really important, you need to look at their airway, I'm not saying that they're not saying no, but they're seeing a whole gamut of patients throughout the day of different things that they need to also be specialized in. Um, So I think taking the time to collaborate with those professionals, or at least like I did, talk to them and be like, hey, did you know we can do this? (laughs) Or like we- Educating them for sure. Yeah. Take patients off your hands. Um, And I thought that the ENTs were so- um, accepting of that too. And the fact that they're like, oh, we don't have to always prescribe medication. It'd be so nice for us to just send them to you to try voice therapy first. Um, Because again, being in a rural area, I think there wasn't as many, there's not as many speech pathologists like myself um, or just speech pathologists, specialized myofunctional therapists in general in this area. So they didn't have a lot of people to refer to. So then I think they also got closed minded that it's like, well, I have to then be the only person that helps them fix this problem. And that is probably, you know, medication or a surgery or that's kind of about it. Um, And so I think they also were like, oh, wow, (laughs) that's so great that we can refer to you and not always have to just 
have those other things be the number one answer and try other outlets first. So um, yeah. that's, <laughs> that's how I got into the ENT um, space. And what was awesome is, yeah, after that email, things just kind of took off and I built the program to being full time. Um, and then we also ended up hiring a second SLP as well. So um, really cool. And then um, I think we'll kind of like dive into that. But the the speech program kind of outgrew itself. And with me getting really invested in um, lactation and infants and feedings, that was more of like a specialization or a niche that I wanted to see more and more of. But again, within their practice of seeing general population, we were getting a whole slew of patients, which was great to kind of broaden my skills and horizons. But I was kind of just like really wanting to see more and more of those babies. Um, so I was super nervous and scared because they honestly, I had such a great experience with this practice with this ENTs and had such a great relationship with them, but I wanted to do more. Um, and they also kind of were at max capacity for us just having two SLPs. And I'm like, I think that we could help more families and more speech therapists and all this stuff. Um, so I presented to them, um, transitioning their speech department to my own private practice. So I'm not affiliated with them at all, but like I kind of took their program and made it my own. Um, and they were actually a hundred percent on board with that, which was shocking and phenomenal and great because as you probably know too, like I didn't want to damper that relationship because they are a huge referral source for me. Yeah. And yeah. likewise, so um, if that wouldn't have gone well, um, that would have been really hard. So I now have um, a private practice called Child Works Therapy Clinic here in Sioux City um, that um, I have five other therapists now that work for me. And um, yeah, we've been open two years. So that was a long story. But that's no, I love it. I want, I have so many questions. Like, yes, yes. like every, okay. So because we're here right now, let's talk about the transition into the private practice more because I feel like, okay, that's great. They were like fully on board, but like, I would just love for you to share because there's other private practice owners. Like, were there any things you, anything you learned, anything you would have done differently? Was it all like, you know, rainbows and unicorns, nothing ever is. So, you know, I'm just gonna throw that out there. Um, I also want to, we'll talk about this like after, but I, like you had said, like you really realized that the ENTs just didn't know. Right. And it really took education. And that's even with you being in their office. And so, you know, I'm just so curious to know too, like, were there things you learned from them? Was it like, I just feel like it seems like such a beautifully mutual, like relationship yeah. that I feel like we talk about that need for collaboration all the time. So we can come back to that later. Let's talk about the private practice first. Um, but yeah, I'm just, just that transition. Like, how was that? Like, Whatever you're willing to share. It was, it was difficult. And before I even presented, obviously, the idea to them, I needed to get my ducks in a row and, you know, know what that was going to look like. So what I had to do a ton of research on and in was obviously um, insurance. So because um, all the patients, if I was going to transition the program, I thought I had to accept insurance because everyone that was seeing me at... ENT was a, we were able to build their medical insurance. So I obviously needed to dive into that world and understand what did that look like? What does it look like to get credentialed, to be a network, to bill insurance, all of that, because I wasn't really having to do a lot of hands-on things with that besides obviously understanding codes and that kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, obviously this is very state specific, um, insurance provider specific, but um, luckily in Iowa, um, a lot of insurance companies reimbursement for speech and feeding was actually pretty good. Um, and so I was, I was really nervous obviously to be like, okay, I'm going to transition the speech department, but only take private pay, but you're used to being able to use your insurance. So that was like, I don't know if I can do that. And thankfully, I think thankfully <laughs> I didn't have to because the insurance reimbursement rates were, were pretty good for us, but that was just a lot of a learning curve of learning. Like, again, how do I credential understanding the billing, um, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So that was a learning curve. Um, and then, 
Yeah, so <laughs> they let me work literally up until two weeks before I opened my own. So behind the scenes of working full time, I also was trying to get my own like clinic space. So I did get like a brick and mortar like clinic space ready. And thankfully I should say too, the other SLP that we hired, I had her come with me as well. And so she took a chance. <laughs> I love her. She took a chance on me um, in doing this. And so, yeah, we were getting all of that stuff ready. And then I took two weeks off and then we opened our doors. Um, so, yeah, there's been a lot of learning going on. Um, I'm sure you can relate. I It is so much hard work, but it's hard work for yourself. And it's hard work for something that you want and you love and it's for you. So I feel like the hard work is, is worth it. Um, you know, I think my husband was someone that has from the beginning been like, you should do this. I'm like, it's not that easy. It's not that easy. Stop saying that <laughs> he's more business minded. Um, and he was like, no, you should do it. You should do it. Um, and you know, I think it was him who's like, you've never like turned down hard work before. So why is this something like, you know, if you work hard at it and it's something that you want to be successful at, I think you will. And that's kind of stuck with me because yeah, I don't want it to fail. Not that I couldn't ever, I guess, but I don't want it to fail. So I'm working my butt off, but it's for me and it feels good. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess any person that's like nervous about that, I guess I just like would want them to reflect on like, if this is for you, like, I think you know that you'll work, you know, your butt off to <laughs> to make yeah. it work and to make it your own. And yeah, it's blood, sweat, tears, money, all the things. But um, I'd rather work hard for this than to be driven into the ground by something I can't control or productivity rules that don't have my best interests at heart. So yeah. that yeah. is... Well, and I think that's, I think that's great advice. And I think it's also realistic advice too, right? Because it's like, I think going into it, a lot of people kind of, you know, and I, I mentor private practice owners and a lot of them will say to me, well, I got into this because I wanted to make my own schedule. I got into this because I wanted the control. I didn't know when I got into this that I was going to be working more now as my own business owner than I did for anybody else. And so there's always like the pros and cons to everything, right? And kind of like what makes the most sense for you. And so I love that you highlighted like blood, sweat, tears, money. Like it's not, it's not easy. Like, sure. Can you try to do certain things to make things easier for yourself? Absolutely. But starting a business takes work. It takes time. It takes money. It takes energy. It takes dedication. Like you need to be so clear and like what you're wanting at, as like the end result. Like you may not know how to get to that result. Right. But it's like, you just need to kind of know what you're doing. Cause you kind of go into it blindly with like, Oh, I just want to work for myself. Cause that seems like a fun little gig. You're going to be severely disappointed. Like, it's not... mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. do you have any other advice now as, as someone who's gone through this that you want to, I mean, again, it's not to like, you think, you know, in like, I guess my realm kind of, like I said, was always to like help more families. Like, I feel like because we're in more of a rural space, like that's what was killing me is that not many families were getting these resources. Maybe they had heard of them, but no one around here was doing it. So my goal always was, I guess, to hopefully be able to expand my private practice to have more therapists that have the skill set I have, or even their own unique skill set too, um, so that we could help more families. So my goal also with my private practice was to grow, but again, that takes a lot of time, blood, sweat, and tears. But with that, now that I'm two years in and have myself and five other therapists, now I'm able to put systems in place where I can take days off, where I can work less, or now I do get to drop my oldest son off at kindergarten every morning. Um, and so you know, two years feels like a long time, but it's not. So I know <laughs> yeah. so I'm able now to put more systems in place to support me being able to have more flexibility and, um, time or, you know, to be able to do things that I want to do because I have a supportive staff and I have things in place. But, um, so I guess I will say like, it takes time, but you can get to a place of having that flexibility. Um, but yeah, I, I think that first year to two years to five years can be a grind. And, but then you can set yourself up for how you envisioned it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love the reality sharing. I always tell people like, I will never sugarcoat things because I'm like, a part of it is like my identity, my own reputation. I don't want you to like, think this is going to be easy. And then you come back and be like, Holly, you lied to me. 
Like, no, like let's talk about the realities of owning businesses and the ish that happens as a business owner, how many fires you have to put out every week. You know, it's like things happen. And, and sometimes look, you're like, okay, everything just seems to be like free flowing right now. Everything is good. It's in a good place. And I'm always like, I'm going to ride this way for as long as I can, because you never know what's going to happen, you know? And it's, it's yeah. one of the things that I tell everybody though, is like, it's, I always say it's like the universe testing you. Something happens. You feel like there's like fires that put out. I'm like, okay, universe, like what is the lesson in this? Like, what are you trying to teach me right now? And like, I, I'm someone who's like, I'm not a quitter. So most of the time, you know, my, re my response is going to be not how do we fix this, but like, there's always a solution. So what is the solution? What is the best case scenario? Let's weigh all of our options here. Let's kind of figure out how to push forward. Right. And I encourage people to like go in with the mentality that, you know, anything you do in life, right? It's if it's something you want badly enough, and if the mission is larger than you, like it's always worth it in the end. And, and that's it's been true for me in everything I've done. And I feel like it's kind of mirrors what you said, where you were saying, like, okay, now you've got the team, you got you know amazing people who are there, basically running the show and the therapist treating the patients, and now you're able to put systems in place and carve out that time that you desire. And that's again the whole reason why you did this was you know, to do something for yourself. And I know a lot of us like echo that whole, I want to do something for myself. I want to be able to decide when I'm there and when I'm not there, I want to be able to take my child somewhere and drop them off at school if that's what I want to do. Right. And so I love that. And because, you know, two years is, it sounds like a long time. That's actually amazing that you've built this that fast and that you've been able to shift things in your schedule to allow you to not have to be at the office all the time and to take your child and drop them at kindergarten in the morning. And, you know, there are people who are 10 years into this that would dream of that. So, you know, I, I don't want to like downplay what you've done because I think it's, I really think it's incredible and, you know, kudos to you because again, you know, the other thing you said too, it really sounded like you spoke to your team and being able to have team members. And, you know, that's why I love keeping my private practice. I tell people, I'm like, my private practice is not anywhere close to being the money producing thing that my online business is, but I keep it because I'm like, it makes me some money. I'm like, but I keep it because I love being able to offer those services, those specialty services. I love my team. I love being able to have a team that gets paid well for the work that they're doing that, enjoys the work they're doing. It's like that mission is just like so much larger than me at this point yeah. that I'm like, you know, I'm not saying I'll have a private practice forever. I don't know. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. I don't know. I never like to say definitive. So I'm like, you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. Right. <laughs> but again, it comes back to that larger mission at hand. And I'm like, if we can be part of that change, that's pro providing these so desperately needed services. And I can make sure that they you know, are available and that people who are giving them love what they're doing and they're highly qualified and, you know, yada, yada, whatever. I'm like, and I get to pay them really well to do it. I'm like, that makes my heart happy. It's self-serving too, but larger mission. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, and I will say a little off of that is, um, you know, I, uh, we all went through an adjustment period during COVID, right? So I had a baby, this is when I was still at the ENT private practice. Um, I had a baby two weeks into COVID um, and uh, you know, all of us were home a lot. And also we weren't able to go to the doctor as much or go to specialists as much unless it was absolutely necessary. Um, and that was also so heartbreaking for me that again, so many moms and families, especially breastfeeding or bottle feeding, but babies weren't getting the support like maybe they were before or especially now during this time um and i even felt that way like a little bit isolated and i do this for a job <laughs> and still like was trying to navigate a newborn during covid and so that is where i did um decide to start my um instagram page the my feeding babes underscore slp uh as like a way to try to uh, it was kind of like a passion project outlet but also it was trying to be like parents here's some things you could try while we can't go to the doctor or while we can't um you know go to specialists about this like here's some tips and tricks um and i love doing that like i loved it um and so i've continued to share but i feel like that also is what kind of set the the stage for me going into private practice as well, because more families were reaching out to me and were like, 
you know, how can we see you or how can we consult with you or how can we, um, and I'm like, well, you know, you can call this <laughs> number or, um, and I just felt a little, um, limited with how I could actually truly help them, you know, besides just my Instagram page. So, um, with how much like support and excitement I was getting from that, it kind of like, I guess, spun me into feeling more confident in starting my private practice. Um, so I don't know if that's a tip or trick, not to start an Instagram account, but like sometimes there's a way to, I feel like dabble or dip your toes and see like, is this really what I want or not? And yeah. how does it, how is it received? How does it take off? And in my case, it was super well received. And so I think that also gave me the confidence that people were trusting me or understanding that I was more specialized in these areas and wanted my services. And so I felt like it kind of helped to validate that, like, I can do this. Like people do yeah. want to see me. They want my services. Like I can do this. Yeah. Well, and so with the ENTs, so obviously like you were in there, you, you got yourself into that office, built a whole program. Like that's amazing. Um, for people who are like, okay, well, you know, I want to start my own private practice or I want to collaborate more with ENTs, but like that's, that opportunity is not present because I have a job already or ENTs are not interested in having me in their office. Just having been in an ENT office, do you have any like advice on how professionals like SLPs or IBCLCs or OTs or whoever, right. On how maybe they can like reach out to ENTs and offer to collaborate with them. Cause you know, I think in some instances, like we all just assume ego gets in the way. And I do think there are really great professionals on all sides that want to collaborate. Um, they don't want to tell, be told what they, you know, what they know or don't know. Right. But yeah. like, what do you have any advice, like having been in that office on how to maybe even approach ENTs? Yeah. I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. Like, I think all of us have a little bit of an ego thing, right? Like, <laughs> We think we're no one right. wants to be told like what to do, right? <laughs> yeah. That's what we do. And we don't want to be told that we're not or that we have to be doing it a certain way. And I will say with working in that office, that's how I did try to always present it of like, hey, um, you know, this kid that I'm working on him advancing his diet, but like we are choking and gagging a lot and his tonsils are enormous. <laughs> so, and not saying that that's the only reason, obviously we know there's like lots of different yeah. things. Um, but kind of like, I guess, again, I lucked out because I was in the office, but being able to have a conversation of like, you know, I'm seeing this and I think, you know, that would be really helpful if you could help me look into it and more in a way of like, here's what I'm seeing. Here's what I'm trying to do the, to help the patient, but I need your help. So doing it in a way yeah. of like, how can you help me? Mm -hmm. Um, and I felt like that really helped my relationship building that I wasn't coming in there and was like, you know, this kid has large tonsils. I need you to take them out. You know, right. I'm not, you can't say anyways, but yeah, exactly. You can't say that. But like, I get what you're saying. Yeah. I really think that there are professionals and, you know, the ENTs have even expressed that to me that sometimes there are, um, you know, different dentists or even different myofunctional therapists that have come about in the area that will send a letter, you know, with their patient, which I don't think is necessarily a bad idea, but it'll be very much like you need to do this, this, and this. And I think, you know, as surgeons who went to years and years and years of school um and just as a professional no one likes to be told how to do their job right so right. i think if you can present information if there is a way to actually collaborate on the phone i think that's the best way to actually hear someone's tone of voice that's what i've learned is emails are interpreted wrong sometimes letters are interpreted wrong um i know it's not always the reality but if there is a way that you can actually meet in person or have a phone conversation um i think that those conversations go way better and you can yeah. hear the other person's tone and understand where they're coming from. Um, and so that was my biggest thing is I always was like, here's what I'm working on, but I think I need your help. Like, do you think you can help me with like this aspect of it? And I felt like they were much more open to like, oh yeah, Abby, I'll look into that for you, you yeah. know, instead of, um, telling them like, again, how to do their job. It's psychology, right? It's sort of like the ego protects us. So you start to tell someone how to do something or what you need. And they're like, uh, you think you know better than me, right? Versus you being like, hey, this is what we're working on. Like, I really need your help. And it's like, the ego is kind of like, oh, okay, what can I do for you? Like, you know what I mean? It's like all about kind of like, so I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's amazing. And I think, you know, same with speech pathology. Like we, I've been lucky and you too, Holly, and like that we have been able to specialize, but our 
um, occupation also is very vague. We see a very whole host of things. And that was the other thing with learning about the ENTs, like I was saying, is they are, they were general ENTs. So sometimes my like super important thing for them, they're like, okay, but like, how's that going to help them? Or, you know, <laughs> and we are passionate about this area. So I feel like I'm always looking at the latest research and things like that, but I don't know the latest research in regards to like laryngectomies or, you know, things like that. And so they have to know a whole host of information. And so I thought that they were very open to, and I'd be like, Hey, like, this is what we're learning, you know, about tongue ties and how it's affecting like airway and the palate and airway development. And it was funny because one of the older ENTs, he was the one that originally started it. He was like, oh yeah, we talked about that, you know, at the very beginning of med school. And he's like, sometimes I forget about that. <laughs> or, you know, like <laughs> we had five minute discussion around that. Right. Okay. I haven't talked about that in 30 years, but let's have a conversation. <laughs> Um, or like one of the ENTs, she had to like take a continuing ed course or some sort of like test to kind of, uh, get some credits or something. And she texted me and she was like, Abby, what the heck? I'm have a true or false question that says there's a study that shows that myofunctional therapy, it couldn't be more effective than a CPAP. Um, and, uh, she was like, I put false and it said that it's true. And she was like, what the heck? I should be sending more patients to you for myofunctional therapy versus prescribing the CPAP. And I'm like, you know, aha, yes. <laughs> um, but, and so she was like, oh my gosh, like there's just so much more I need to understand about myofunctional therapy. Like we should, you know, have coffee again sometime. And this is like out when I wasn't working there anymore. Um, but I just love that she can like, you know, text me about those things. Um, Relationship building, you know, to it, and yeah. uh, you know, same with. I feel like because again, I was so lucky that I was in the space and we could like have conversations in real time in real life. Um, you know, just recently I had um, a baby who, uh, you know, they had a tongue and lip tie, and but also um, their was it their chiropractor, I think, um, was concerned that they also had buckle ties. Um, and so that was before they had seen me, like went and saw the ENT, one of the ENTs that I work with. And she texted me and she was like, Abby, you know, I don't feel like there's a lot of research to support that right now, but I know this is ever evolving. So I'm interested in learning more, but I'm just going to tell you, I don't feel comfortable releasing those in those patients, but I'm not against it. If you think that they need to go to a dentist that does do it. So I even thought that that was like, cool. Yeah, it was like, that's huge. Hey, I don't, I don't really feel super comfortable with this. And I'm not saying that it's wrong. I just feel like there's not enough research yet for me to feel comfortable doing it. And I haven't done it yet. So I don't think you want this patient to be my first yeah. <laughs> one to do it on. And I was like, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, so I just feel like, again, I have a very unique, cool situation where I'm able to have super open conversations with these ENTs and they respect my opinion and I respect theirs. Yeah. Well, and you know, I'll share like one story. We have an ENT that we finally found after years and years and years in the DC metro area where one of my therapists treated the child of that ENT. And all of a sudden they, that ENT was like, wait, why aren't there more ENTs doing this? Why are they not like aligning with you? Why are they not? And I, and, you know, truly it, it we've tried educating and you know, you're not going to win everybody over. Right. So there is that side of this conversation too. And, and then sometimes you win people over or they take the courses or they seem to know what they're doing, but then their, their treatment plan is not matching the education that you think they have and the conversations that you're having. And you're kind of like, obviously I'm not an ENT, so I can't tell you you're doing your job wrong, but what was the point of us even referring the child to you? Cause we're kind of still here at square one or back to square one. So, you know, so to have this individual, right. And to have some conversations with him and to, you know, he was like, send me, send me some things to read. Like, send me, I mean, I feel like there are those people out there, like you said, who are one interested in relationship building not just for referral purposes, but because they want to learn more. And I truly think that's what makes the best doctor, clinician, therapist, right? It's the person who is ever evolving and who recognizes that what we were doing five years ago may not be relevant anymore today. And what we're doing today may change five years from now. And those are just completely, you know, random numbers. Um, but we do know like research takes 17 years to appear published in a journal. And so if we're so behind, I think that recognizing that what's happening in practice right now may not come to light for a very long time 
on a more global scale, right? It's like, that's where I had just such an appreciation for these providers, right? Regardless of what profession they're in that are kind of like, okay, like you said, like, I don't really know enough about this. What, like, what should I read or what courses should I take? Like, I love that. And I also love when they can say, okay, I don't disagree with this, but also I have no experience. So I'm not comfortable doing this versus the one that'll say, we've had them where they're like, well, I don't really see a tongue tie, but I'll release it anyways. And I'm like, ah, no, you won't. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. Yes. Away from the patient. <laughs> I mean, so you, you hear all kinds of things, right? I mean, it's just like, it's all over the place, but I think it comes back to relationship building, being able to put an ego aside, like noticing when your ego is kind of like playing a role and, and look, our ego, like I said, it keeps you safe. So we need it, but we also need to know like when to kind of say, Hey ego, like I feel, still feel safe, even though I know nothing about this. Like you can sit over here while I go take a course or have a conversation with a colleague. Right. And so I just like, I'm always like more of that, please. <laughs> Exactly. And I will say, like, I'm kind of making it sound like it's been the perfect scenario, but no, there's been a ton of learning on their side and my side. And yeah, finding that because there was four of them, each one of them had their own personality and perspective and way of, um, you know, treating some of these things that I was sending them to. Um, so that was something that we, I had to navigate and understand and yeah, work through that too. So it wasn't all like, perfect and pretty all the time. Um, will, you, will you talk more about that? Like some of the things that you, you learned from ENTs that you feel like would be beneficial to our listeners, other providers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I think with it, so one thing that comes to mind, I think too, is, uh, the insurance world. And I hate to bring that into this, but sometimes I know us on the outside and I accept insurance. So I kind of get it, but like, um, we think it's easy to be like, well, I'm referring to the ENT. He has enlarged tonsils or adenoids. Like, why can't we just take him out? Or like, um, you know, they have enlarged turbinates or all this sinus stuff. And unfortunately, sometimes their hands are tied a little bit too in the way that like, you have to prove to insurance that they need a procedure or they need a surgery. And I'm not saying like I force patients to go do that. I'm not saying that, but you know, like sometimes they had to prove that they've had strep throat four times before actually like insurance would approve them to take their tonsils out. So sometimes too, we can be angry or like frustrated that like they're humongous. Why can't they just take them out? But unfortunately, sometimes there's like a process with yeah. some of that. Um, so I had to learn some of that too, because yeah, I would get frustrated with, um, sometimes making a referral of like, Oh my gosh, this kid's airway. Like I, we need help. Um, and it would be like, you know, let's wait and see, or let's do another round of antibiotics or things like that. Um, and so those were kind of tough conversations where they enlightened me that like, we see what you're saying, Abby, but sometimes there is a process we have to follow or also like we're getting them in our office. And then the parent says to us, like, we don't want them to have surgery whatsoever, things like that. But yet the parent wouldn't share that with me or, you know, and I think I'm making it sound like I'm telling every patient to go get their tons. That's not the case, but no, I'm just no, no. we know you're not <laughs> just an example, just an example. I'm trying to share examples of like, you know, things that like, you know, I would maybe have a conversation with, with the parent and I thought that it went really well. And then that parent would maybe, you know, get in their chair. And say something completely opposite. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Or, yeah. you know, or maybe interpret something I said um, and then present it in a way that did sound very maybe like demeaning or <laughs> egotistical. Um, and so those were sometimes hard conversations that, you know, they would come and be like, so you told this patient that they should do this. And I was like, oh, whoa, no, no, no. And so that's, again, I was super lucky that we were in the same office so I could just go in there and talk to him about it. Um, but those are, uh, you know, a few examples of, of things that like, I didn't always understand or when you send a patient to a specialist, um, you know, sometimes we're frustrated with like the recommendations they make or how they're not listening to us. And maybe that's the case, but sometimes I feel like there can be more to it and, it and it's more out of our control and less about us than not respecting our recommendations or our referral reasoning. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's actually a really amazing share because 
I'm sitting here going, yeah, actually, okay, so maybe it's not about us. And our ego is putting us at the center of this conversation <laughs> going, they don't, they don't respect us. They don't care about our opinion. We're not saying do surgery. We're saying like, this is not enough. Like we need more. Right. And, yeah. and, you know, and I've been through it with my own kids. Right. So I've seen some of the process and I'm like, so maybe that, that anger, that frustration is misdirected. Maybe it needs to be towards the American medical system, which I think a lot of us are frustrated with too. Right. You know, I, and, and I've seen this where they, I've been told about like, you know, well, first they have to try several rounds of medication and then they might have to do this. And, you know, and I think that's where it's like, okay, people who are super fired up, maybe you should go create an action committee and go, you know, <laughs> go straight to like CMS. Maybe you should change how things are done. Cause I know like now, for example, if a child can go for a sleep study and it can demonstrate sleep apnea, then they can go right for tonsillectomy if that is the prescribed procedure and route, you know, the parents are on board and the ENTs recommended and all that, you know? So I know that I think things are changing in that way, but I almost like, as you're saying this, I'm like, huh, maybe if you're one of those people's like super fired up about this, maybe you should be thinking about how do we make change on a more like global level? Like when I say global, I mean more like, you know, United States of America, not globally on the map, um, but with our medical system, because that really, I think drives the ship in many ways. And I sure, you know, I'm sure you can appreciate that more than me just being in network with some insurances. Um, but yeah, that's, that I know is such a big thing. And the relationship building, like I've had cases where it's like, well, this parent said this to my therapist and then, you know, said this to the dentist and told us this about the dentist, told the dentist this about us. And I was like, nip it in the bud. Like, I don't know what is happening right now. I don't know if this is intentional or not intentional. I don't care, but this is my relationship I've built with the dentist. So I'm going to go reach out to that person right now and say, Hey, do you have five minutes to discuss what's going on here so that we can just, and, and I will tell you every single time we have been told different things and I'm not judging. I'm not judging because it could also just be that person's comfort level with a dentist versus you. It could be that they respect you and they don't want you to feel disrespected by disagreeing with something. And maybe we read the situation wrong. You know, it, it does fall back on us as well. You know, maybe they feel more comfortable in the dentist's office because they're going to go there a couple times and never go back there. So now they're just over here saying a completely different thing. You know, who knows? Who knows? At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. I feel like at the end of the day, it is our responsibility, right, as medical professionals and adults to basically put on our adult pants that day, have a conversation that sometimes may feel kind of icky with a referring provider or with, you know, a provider we refer to and basically just kind of like lay it all out there. And I will tell you that those conversations always end well in my experience. It's never like, you know, because sometimes they'll even say to me, I didn't really think that you would say that, but I wanted to give the patient the benefit of the doubt because why would they just make that up? You know, and I'm like, I don't know. And I don't, we don't need to rationalize this one way or the other. Let's just have a unified approach together so that we either can help the patient and we make sure we're all on the same page and we give them a safe space to explore what feels right for them and we support them in that you know, and, or they don't like us and they go a different route, which is fine too. You know, it's like, we, we're not for everybody. So, you know, I, I think it's just, people don't realize like when, even though you're in medicine, like these conversations are still very critical, especially in situations where you're getting this, like he said, she said, and nothing's matching up. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. And I think, yeah, ex you, exactly what you said is sometimes all of that is what kind of makes it messy and it shouldn't be messy. Um, yeah. But I also think you kind of, said the same thing with the ENT you've collaborated with. Like, I feel like I've been lucky in that, you know, my work or my therapy has also kind of spoken for itself. Like, you know, I'm able to help these patients. The patients are providing positive feedback to these providers. And so then that's also helped me build my network beyond ENT is also dentists in the area. You know, like I've been able to, when I first moved here, I don't know if there was a ton of dentists really looking on the airway side of things, or even, I think there was one dentist that was perf um, performing, um, you know, like tongue tie releases. Um, and now we've built a pretty awesome network. And I think it's, you know, been like the patient is like, Hey, my dentist said that they have this overjet because they keep pushing their tongue out. And I'm like, okay, let's talk about this. And, um, you know, and you're like, the dentist isn't wrong, but I don't know if the dentist understands all, of, you know, this specific one understands maybe, you know, like, how can I help you with that? Um, but then also how can they help me <laughs> with right. that? Um, and so I think that, yeah, in a awesome way to my specialization um, and the, the good outcomes that a lot of my patients have, gotten has been like 
I guess, positive word of mouth that more professionals have been reaching out to me and like, Hey, like, can we collaborate? And I think that's really awesome. If you know, I'm sure you agree. Like we yeah. have more people, um, that are like-minded and all thinking the same way that also makes it easier for change to happen in the medical or dental space. 100%. You know, I think a lot of us talk about the need for collaboration, but then when it comes down to it, it's like, but how? <laughs> and so I love that you know, we kind of dove into that today because I think it's a necessary conversation, but I think you also hopefully, you know, shed some light for some providers on the nuances in collaborating and not just building those relationships, but continuing those relationships too. Because a lot of times it's like, well, how do we find the referral sources? Well, once you do find them, you have to nurture them. Like just like you would in any, it's, it's a business. You're in a business, they're in a business. Just if, you know, like in my online business, like people have to be nurtured. They have to know that you care and they have to know that like you really want the best. And yes, we can assume that about everybody, but unfortunately we live in a time where like you have to constantly remind people of that too. So, you know, it's, you know, and genuinely, right? I'm not saying go do this if you don't actually care, but like if you genuinely do care and you genuinely want to like keep those relationships and you enjoy like what you're doing and how what you're building and helping with, like that is a very like nurturing relationships is a critical part of any business whether it's a private practice, a medical office, you know, in a hospital which is even harder there, but you know, and there are certain nuances too, right. That make it very challenging to do this in certain places, but this has been amazing. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you want to share? Um, I don't think so. Um, I think besides, uh, more so, I guess getting to more, just really quick, the IBCLC side of things, um, yeah. and kind of going off of what you just said, I think, <laughs> That if you are treating babies and you can make a lasting positive impact with parents or moms, that is also a very awesome way to like gain business because moms that are helped during postpartum or feel supported or feel confident, um, that part of my business is just exploding in a positive way, which is what I always wanted because I love the babies. Like give me the babies. Um, and that has what has kind of built my like brand or caseload is in, and I know you can relate. I can relate as a mom of three boys. Um, when you walk into an office and as a mom, you feel like you are being heard and you're being supported and loved and that provider wants what's best for you and your baby. Um, you know, moms talk about that mom groups, mom get togethers, yeah. <laughs> family members, all of that. Um, and so I will say that area of my practice more than anything has just really um, exploded. And I, I think it's just because like being able to be specialized and be collaborative has just helped so many of my moms and babies get best care and best outcomes. So I just yeah. kind of wanted to touch on that. Yeah. No, those word of mouth referrals, they will carry you any day, every day. I've never done paid advertising like in my private practice. I think I tried it like once I put like $150 that I got for free from Google, like into like some ads <laughs> and I got no calls. And I was like, I don't really need this. I mean, I get all these word of mouth referrals. Everyone's tagging me in the Facebook groups. And I think that really speaks to like some of the other things we've talked to too, where like, you know, yes, you're hearing the patients, you're, you're the moms, you're, you know, they trust you. They feel supported. They don't feel like you're just taking their money and doing what you feel like you need to do. You're actually asking them, how can I help you? And really, you know, listening to them. And that's, that's huge. And it's a skill that's actually, unfortunately lacking in a lot of private practices out there. And so, you know, to any private practice owner in any realm, if you want to build your business, like maybe take a good look and hard look in the mirror and ask if like, one, are you aligned with what you're doing? Do you actually want to be doing it? Or is it just something that you feel like makes you money? So that's why you're doing it. Right. And then two, like, could you just ask your patients, like, how can I help you today? Like what's going on? And just like be silent and let them respond to you. Be like, how are things going? How was this past week since I saw you last? Like when you ask these like open questions and you actually listen to listen, not listen to respond, but like listen to actually help figure out what to do that day in the session and how to help them like continue making progress going forward. It's very different than like picking up your papers and being like, well, step one said this and now step two said that. So like, I'm going to ask them if they did their homework and how the last week was, but then we're going to jump into step three. Like, no, none of that. <laughs> yes. Yes. 
Yes. And I love that. I will say, I feel like that's some of the best feedback I get about my private practice beyond me, even just my own therapist is like, you know, so many of our families feel like they have a relationship with their therapist. And I'm like, that's what we want. Like that's, you know, because as you know, we are doing the 30 to 45 minutes a week with you. The, the parents are what has to help us implement everything we want. Um, and if they're on our side and they respect us and they can come to us, um, outcomes also improve and increase. And yeah, so I, I agree with you hundred percent that that relationship is one of the biggest drivers to helping, I feel like private practices be successful. Yeah. Well, this has been amazing. I know we could talk private practice all day long. Um, I love everything business. I love what you've done. This is, and this is very cool. Thank you for sharing your perspective. Also just having been in an ENT office and then also just, you know, maintaining those relationships, but also building outside, you know, relationships with other professionals outside of that too. Cause I know that's, that's a big pain point, I think for a lot of private practice owners. So yes. thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me on. This has been fun. Yeah, this is awesome. Thanks for listening to this podcast. If you found value in this episode and want to hear more of these myotots, airway, and feeding related episodes, be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts and share this episode on your social media platforms. You can access free resources and all I offer at hallybalkin.com or pop over to at hallybalkin on Instagram to get all the latest updates.